Welcome to episode 6 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. I'm Tony, and last week Alan, Dave and I went to the Ubuntu Developers Summit in Prague. In this episode, Alan and I talk about our impressions of UDS while sitting at the airport waiting to go home. We also says a new competition, and in a change from our usual format, we've got a great interview with Mark Shuttleworth, which we've split in two. Sounds like a fun-packed show. Let's get on with it. UDS for Intrepid is just finished. It's Saturday morning now, uh, definitely the morning after the night before. So what are your thoughts about uh, FOSCAMP and UDS? Um, well, I was lucky enough to get sponsored for um, FOSCAMP and UDS by Canonical. They paid my travel and hotel and, and all that. And I, first of all, want to thank them for you know giving me the opportunity to come out here. Um, this is the third UDS I've been to. And um, they're always a great event. The first time you go, it's it's a bit overwhelming, and uh, it's it's somewhat strange because there are so many people there who already know each other, and you might know some of the people be- through communication online via IRC, the forums, or mailing lists. But then when you meet them for real, it's it's kind of cements those relationships. So one of the big things I like about UDS is cementing relationships that have been built up online. And at Foscamp, there was an e- we had an event where upstream, so that's people who provide packages and people who provide applications to the Ubuntu distribution would come along and we talked together about relationships between distros and relationships between distros and upstream and uh, things that we might want to fix. And it was a good couple of days uh, on Friday and Saturday last week. And then we had the five days of uh, f- uh, UDS from Monday to Friday. Now, UDS is uh, quite a big event. Similarly to, Fos- uh, to FOSDEM, in a way, there's lots of different sort of threads of, of different areas. But unlike FOSDEM, where it's talks and presentations um, from people in the project to people who aren't in the project, this is all sort of roundtable discussion. It really is uh, a summit rather than a conference. You can see why they chose that name. Yeah, it's, it's always... Um quite clear on the wiki page that describes each UDS, it's quite clear that this isn't a conference, but people are, are, it's fine for people to come, and if they want to pay their own way and turn up and, you know, uh, and help out, then that's great, but it's not, it's not like, like you say, it's not like uh, FOSDEM, where you sit down and ingest information from people who are giving talks, it's, it's more about contributing back, and so these roundtable discussions, which are streamed over the internet, um, and you know people can join in via IRC and so on during these uh, conversations and that's really what they are they're conversations between relevant parties during those conversations you you form um, preliminary plans for what's going to be in the next version of Ubuntu and decisions are made as well you know do we do this do we drop support for this do we include this application and it, it, it is actually really uh, the place where Intrepid will be given its structure really, a skeletal structure I mean things will, will change during the course of things but having come away from this week I think the developers and things have got a really clear idea of the way they're heading at the moment Yeah and, and that's that's always nice to see and, and in fact you do see change over the, the following six months because new applications arrive and new packages arrive in the repositories and, and that changes some of the feel and, and maybe the artwork is under development and that gets changed part way through the cycle and, and so on and, and so whilst yes there's a skeletal structure started here it, it's certainly built upon over the next six months that was one of the things that i hadn't really expected to see i uh, i assumed it would be basically entirely developers but we have people like ken who does the artwork for ubuntu and other people who do uh, similar kind of design work and things like that all involved in discussions as well um, so it's not just a case of, well, well, how do we code this or how do we hack this stuff together? Yeah, I mean, it's surprising. There's, there's surprisingly little, um, you know, ones and zeros kind of like really deeply technical talk. I mean, obviously there is some fairly technical talk, um, but a lot of it is at a higher level, like view from a, a thousand feet of what's what's going to happen. And yeah, I've, I've met people here who um, are not developers. I mean, I'm not a developer. I, I see myself as... Um, if you think of a set of concentric circles, you've got right in the middle, you've got the the core team who some work for Canonical and some don't. And then just outside that, you've got all the developers who are also contributing. 
and then as the further out you get you've got people who are less and less involved in that development process they may be in the community and they may help out in other ways but they're not necessarily directly affecting packages in the system and I consider myself to be on that outside periphery watching the developers so a lot of the time it's difficult to to join in with some of those development conversations but equally there are other sessions where I have been able to contribute and um, it's been very good to, to know that you know some of my my input will help form a little part of what goes on to become uh, Intrepid in uh, October later this year. Yeah, I agree. Although saying that there are sort of concentric circles sets up um, a sort of a, a boundary system that I didn't really see reflected. And well, I know you fuzzy. Put, it's kind of fuzzy yeah. lines. Yeah, but one of the nice things uh, about UDS uh, is that you can just walk up and talk to people. Um, I don't suppose you get any closer to the centre than Mark Shuttleworth and he's just milling around and we went out to the a club last night and he's on the back row of the bus with us and chatting away and, and all the other developers and, and the kind of the core team are just floating around people like Scott James Remnant and John O'Bacon and things and, you know, and you're just hang, you're hanging out and things in the evenings and talking to each other during the day about a bunch of, a bunch of related stuff um, so it's not like there's uh, firm boundaries and it does seem to be really easy for people to get involved in bits that they want to get involved in particularly you know they're being able to dial in to sessions there's a there's an ice cast stream so you can listen into the session but there's also a VoIP number so you can dial in and take part in a discussion if you're not able to physically be here which is great because you don't need a huge amount of infrastructure to do that it's, it's just all using the software supplied with Ubuntu. And how many other platforms how many other <coughs> operating systems would give you the opportunity to uh, influence the direction of the next release as a as a as a complete in inverted commas outsider, being able to influence and being able to talk to the core developers and you know ask them how things work and why certain decisions were made and and get the real you know the the real inside track. It's unique. I I, I don't know of any other. I mean, there are other Linux distributions who do similar things, but I can't see uh, Steve Jobs or um, Steve Barmer sitting on the back of the bus with you and me going to a nightclub on a Friday night which is what happened last night you know it, it, it's it's the level of community and the, the closeness of the community I when I say those concentric circles they're very fuzzy and I'm I'm only looking at it from one perspective but when you look at it at a, at a people level the people are very close and there's a video that you shot of um, uh, everyone uh, running to give Daniel Holbach a hug and this was organised because someone um, thought Daniel wasn't very happy one day so he organised everyone to give Daniel a big hug and you know that, that kind of spirit that kind of community spirit is great yeah I, I agree and it's uh, I think Jono said that, that that thing where we all flash hug to Daniel was um, was the essence of Ubuntu it was the spirit of Ubuntu it was just kind of getting involved in that sort of thing as much as it is the technical stuff so the next UDS we have to look forward to will be after uh, Intrepid. So Intrepid releases are scheduled to release in uh, October uh, 2008 and then usually a few weeks of um, calm and uh, then the next uh, UDS, which is a rumour it's going to be back across the pond in the US. It's, it's funny, I, I kind of look forward to each of these UDSs and I try and schedule a bit of time in my calendar hoping that I can get sponsored and, and uh, get to go because it is such a great event. Yeah, I, mean, I I really enjoyed the social stuff in the evenings. Um, because of what I was doing, I was quite kind of in my little room doing my videoing and talks. By the way, you can see those at youtube.com slash Ubuntu developers. Um, that's what I've been doing this week is interviewing various people. And it's been really good to meet those people and chat to them both on camera and off. We're here with Mark Shuttleworth. Hi, Mark. Howdy, how are you? Not too bad, not too bad. Are you enjoying UDS then? Loving it, thank you. Okay, let's get on with the questions. Uh, first one I had is one of the things about Ubuntu and Linux in general is it's all about choice and I've noticed by reading the headers of your mail that you use Mozilla Thunderbird mm -hmm. what software do you use on a, on a daily basis you couldn't, you couldn't get by without I guess that the, the thing that defines me most from a software perspective is Python because it's the tool that I've used for gosh 10-15 years to shape the things that I'm interested in and to try and articulate the things that I'm interested in in a way that will make sense to other coders, right, in a way that makes sense to other developers. So uh, so the, the biggest sort of personal software, software choice I guess I've made in my career has been to use Python very heavily and to, to do what I can to encourage 
um, the spread of that idea. And then other than that, yeah, I'm a heavy user of Mozilla, the Mozilla technologies on all the platforms that I work. You know, I have a Mac, so I install Firefox on that. And I have, um, if I have to use Windows, I'll usually pull Firefox down onto that. Um, I'd love to see Thunderbird more widely more widely adopted. We, we haven't really been able to make it the default mail client in Ubuntu um, because it, it misses a couple of key features. But for the things that I do, I think it's a phenomenal mail client. Um, and I really love the extensions capability. I think that's, that's a sort of a key idea that it enables innovation to flourish. And to me, free software is partly about choice, but it's also about access to just amazing pipelines of, of innovation. Is it difficult making those choices? It is. In fact, probably the hardest, the hardest challenge in the first phases of the project was the initial sort of whittling down of all of Debian to a set of things that we thought presented people with a compelling out-of-the-box experience. You can't help but exclude um, phenomenally good work. And in many cases, there isn't necessarily a clear sort of definitive winner. There, there are different tools which are, depending on the perspective you're looking through or looking from, which are, you know, are better. If you, if you really need one set of features, then of course one tool, you know, jumps out at you. And if you need a different set of features or have a different way of working, then a different tool jumps out at you. And that process within Ubuntu of, of whittling down to a preferred out-of-the-box application is, uh, is both socially and technically quite a tricky process. Um, we did a lot of it right at the beginning, but it's an ongoing process. The, the ones that you named there are, by and large, things that have become part of the standard out-of-the-box experience after, you know, well, since since Warty. So it's an ongoing experience or process. It's very important for us not to conflate personal preferences with this decision. Thunderbird is my personal preferred mail client, but I don't project that into the distribution in any way because my sense is that a balanced perspective still puts evolution as the as the best first choice. That is a dynamic. It is a dynamic process. You know, we, we may well change that decision later, um, but we have the team really tries to separate out their personal preferences of editor or language or tool um, from what's best for the community. I mean, at uh, the last UDS in um, Boston, there was a, a heat, rather heated discussion about whether we should switch from Rhythmbox to Banshee. But it's very. It must be very difficult to throw one product out in favor of something else so you know the, the it is de- a high cost it's a high cost decision yeah because users who upgrade will suddenly potentially find themselves in a in an odd situation where there may be two um two tools for the same thing and other people who are new to the project start talking about one that they're not familiar with so it's not as though it's um uh, it's not as though we can be too dynamic about it. We're very conscious of the cost of making a switch, and we don't want to make a switch lightly. The other thing is that you end up getting opinions from lots of different perspectives. There are people who focus on their use of the tool, and there are also people who focus on, for example, the sort of general philosophical alignment of the tool. So Open Office is interesting. KDE have their own Office platform, and GNOME has its own Office platform, Abbey Word and Gnumeric. And these are both exceptionally good bodies of code. All three of them are great bodies of code for, from different through different glasses we take a lot of flack in the gnome community for not shipping epiphany for example as the default browser um, and to a certain extent also for not shipping sort of gnumeric as the default spreadsheet but ultimately we try and make the decision that that reflects the very best of what the whole free software community has to offer now recently there was a major uh, ssh and ssl vulnerability uh, how do you feel the community reacted to that well you know, first it was a very significant vulnerability, and for someone who's got a strong personal interest in cryptography, um, you know, it was very, very clear as soon as we dis- uncovered this that, that it was going to be a very serious issue, and so we we put a lot of time and effort over a very concentrated period of time to get the best possible response. The team that was working on that was largely sort of canonical security and infrastructure team, but also the Debian guys. Um, and I think the end result was was a really good response to a very serious issue. I don't think one can overstate the, the magnitude of the problem, but the response, I think, was very, very professional. Uh, we shipped a set of updates which immediately detected whether or not people were affected, immediately put in place safeguards so that if third parties were affected and tried to connect to them, they could propagate that information about the problem to them. We did quite a lot of analysis after all the responses in place about how this this defect came into the software. With all of the benefit of hindsight, one can only ascribe it to to human error. You know, like like any sort of tragedy or disaster, it's it's a series of errors. Uh, I think the Debian maintainers have taken a lot of flack, but many people don't realize that they actually did the right thing. They took this patch to the upstream developers. They took it to the main sort of documented forum for for the discussion of these patches. They were given a thumbs up, albeit a a sort of quick sort of sketch analysis. 
Um, and so they applied that patch. Our ecosystem, our process, generally produces very high quality results. Our relationship with Debian, the fact that we combine Debian's sort of super specialized maintainer approach with the Ubuntu whole system um, approach produces a very, very high quality of output, but there, there, will be, there will be mistakes. And what's important then is how well and how effectively we respond to that mistake. Do you think having such a major vulnerability so early in an LTS release has had a, a negative impact? Has it sort of affected the employees at Canonical, the wider community perception of Ubuntu? Of, co- of course it has. It's a, it's a significant setback and, and everybody takes it personally. It's, uh, you know, the, the, I didn't see any indication of people saying, oh, well, this wasn't our bug or this wasn't our patch. We understand that we're fundamentally responsible for the bits that go onto our users' hard, hard disks. It doesn't matter where a piece of code came from. And yeah, the timing on an LTS is really not great. But from my perspective, it's always better to deal with an issue immediately and I'm not going to let you know, concerns about PR get in the way of us doing the effective thing. So I notice the Ship It CDs have been stopped distribution of those because they contain the vulnerability. Is that the server CDs actually have the you know they have SSHD on there, and so they're they're more likely to be a, a problem. And so yes, we will stop distributing those, and we'll ramp up production of a of a rerolled set of images that that doesn't have the issue. Will that wait for eight hundred four point one, or is that something no. you're going to do? No, straight we'll away? we'll get the printing presses going with an updated set of images, and the point one release will go out in due course. What's the current status of Gobuntu? So there will be another release of Gobuntu. Um, we'll do an 8, 804 Gobuntu release. We had a buff about this yesterday here at UDS. And I think we've, we've come to the view that, that the right thing for us to do is first to continue to work on the F6 option, which is the install Ubuntu with no restricted drivers. The give me freedom option. Well, you have a whole lot of freedom on, on a standard <laughs> Ubuntu yeah. CD. Okay. Um, trolling there, Dave. <laughs> I, you know, I, I find that kind of... When, when, when folks are having a discussion about this, it's very easy for people who agree on 99% of things to use that 1% as a, that, that they disagree on as like a bludgeon to, to, to malign one another about. And I really find that not constructive, and it's a real problem in the, open, in the free software community when, it, when that becomes the dominant factor. The, the, the truth is, you know, if you, if you read the archives of the Gobuntu list... Very few people actually had, there was no kind of consensus whatsoever as to what actually constitutes freedom. We'd have one guy coming up and saying, hell, you know, Gobuntu should ship Ice Weasel. And someone else saying, no, 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 wait, that's just a trademark issue. There's nothing, no freedom restriction there. You know, that's, that's not a problem. And then someone else comes along and says, you know, we should only work on machines that run with Linux BIOS. And someone else is saying, what are you, crazy? You know, <laughs> so, so when you get down to that sort of very fundamentalist view, there's nothing wrong with it. That's why we created Gobuntu. We wanted to articulate it. We were unable to build a, you know, a sustainable community that actually had consensus on when you go beyond what Ubuntu provides, what that should mean. And so we looked, we looked at it and what we're going to do is first um, do more work on the F6 option um, and second work with the GNUSense guys to figure out if there's things that we can do that make their lives easier. They have an established community. For better or worse, they have a set of guidelines that you know that they will stick to. Not everybody who was interested in Gobuntu will be interested in GNUSense, so they're kind of going to lose out because they're, 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 there isn't anything that meets their specific set of def- definitions. But I think the GNUSense guys do an admirable set of work, and if we can do anything to make their lives easier, then we 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 will. Um, but Gobuntu, you know, is going to it comes to the end of its life with 8.04, and we'll make that release, and then we'll wind it down. You've got a very high public profile, but because of that profile, you get sometimes a lot of negative reaction on things like your blog um, and in news reports. Does that get to you personally? Do you, are you able to just shrug it off, or does it kind of linger and you know, wind you up a bit? I do get wound up. You know, I, I had some some guy come on to, the, to my blog and, and spout a whole bunch of really quite vicious, nasty stuff. And I, you know, I think, I think to a certain extent that's that's healthy to to remind yourself that that one's own convictions are one's convictions, and and somebody else's ideas or their ideas, I can't be, I shouldn't, I can't be held responsible for for somebody else. I, I sometimes sort of wonder, you know, should I publish that? Some guy mouthing off on on my blog, and I generally do, you know, I, I almost. Only once not, I've only once withheld a comment because it was a guy telling me how he was about to try and hack the site and uh, he failed but um, <laughs> I think it's important to be part of public debate because free software attracts people who are very smart have very good insights into a lot of different things 
it's a little disappointing sometimes when you have positions put forward that are that are very very narrowly defined you know we sort of invite everybody to stand up and and act like they're an expert and sometimes i see people you know putting forward a position that is that just seems to me at least so so to be based on very very narrow sense of of reality do you do, do you do anything to kind of get away from that stretch distance yourself or just put it put yeah, it I behind don't, I, book yeah exactly yeah, <laughs> don't don't space. don't don't, don't press send <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> think a little about it a little bit so there's a there's a bit of a blog interaction um recently where you know I've, i'm 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 really trying to get people to think about this idea of, of, of having more coordination in the free software ecosystem. And I don't know exactly what form that coordination would take, but I do think that having a, a stronger commitment to the idea of coordination will be valuable and good things will come out of it. Anyway, so, so some guy has responded on his blog, and he's, he's painted a very, you know, he's taken a very personal attack. He's made it into a very personal thing. You know, Mark Shuttleworth only says this because he wants that and blah, 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 and fluffy, cloudy ideas, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I wanted to respond personally, you know, screw you and all of your hippie lieutenants. But, <laughs> but instead what I did is just write about the ideas and try and let the ideas stand for themselves, right? Focus the discussion on, on the ideas. If they, if they carry the day, then they carry the day if they don't. I suppose that's one thing that, that because of the profile, you can't just you know, let one rip yeah. uh, back. I mean, somebody had a go at me on my blog, then I could do and. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on my own head be it but you've got the kind of pressure of, of leading the organization yeah and when I make mistakes which I do it costs the whole community uh, you know I, 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 I thought Novell made a mistake once upon a time and, and I kind of teased them about it in a slightly inappropriate way and everybody in Ubuntu felt a little bit ashamed that I'd done that and rightly so and I you know I felt the I felt the lack of love <laughs> <laughs> We've got another competition this week. We've got a lot of them, uh, a lot of these uh, canonical shop vouchers to give away over the coming months. They're they're pretty neat in that you can use the token to buy stuff, or you can use it to buy a part of something. And if there's any value left over, you can use it again later on. Um, you can also use multiple vouchers. So if you happen to win our competition multiple times, then you could, you know, collect enough vouchers to buy yourself. A CD, maybe, <laughs> or something more expensive, perhaps. And there's all sorts of things on the shop. There's the uh, Ubuntu bags, there's T-shirts, uh, all sorts of other bits. I've got one of the bags, the, the messenger bag, or man bag, as some people call it. And, um, yeah, it's, it's had, I've had a few people comment on it and uh, ask me if it's any good and have a look at it. And uh, it's, it's really useful. I, I've managed to fit two laptops and all associated gumph in it. So it's, it's big enough, but also... You know, if you're only carrying a little laptop, there's plenty of space for loads of other stuff to go in there as well. So and if you want to see what you can get from the store, it's shop.canonical.com? Yeah, that's right. It's, it's all grouped into categories, and uh, there's there's uh, apparel and uh, CDs and uh, loads of other bits and bobs on there as well. You can also actually buy uh, support contracts from Canonical through that, that store as well. I don't suppose £20 is going to make much of a dent in that, though. Well, no, but uh, it helps. Every little helps. So head over there and have a look and see what you could get money off if you win the competition. So have we got a question for this week's competition? This week's competition, which we will draw at the end of our next episode, um, the question for that is, what is the name of the Ubuntu installer for Windows that was first released in Hardy? So that's, what is the name of the Ubuntu installer for Windows that was first released in Hardy? And you can email your answers to competition at ubuntu-uk.org. Yeah, that's a special address, different from the normal one. Please make sure you send it to the right one. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll filter out all the uh, wrong answers and put together all the right answers and Mark Shuttleworth will pick the winner. He'll pick it out of the hat. A kind of virtual hat, yes. With... Ubuntu and other ventures such as HBD, which we obviously in the Ubuntu community we don't tend to hear too much about. That's that's you know, your other um, business ventures. The other ninety percent of my life. <laughs> ah, okay. You you clearly have a lot of time occupied with these activities. How do you how do you switch off and unwind? And and do you find that difficult to do? Actually, Ubuntu probably takes ninety percent of my time and energy. So it's it's a very it's a it's, a, it's an unusual move because notionally I'm custodian of a of a 
of a body of wealth that ultimately I want to see put to good use. And so it's a little self-indulgent to spend all of my time on one project, which is, relatively speaking, a sort of a small portion of that investment portfolio. But to me, this project rec represents the single thing that I can best do in the world, right? It, 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 it's a unique combination of of investment opportunity, because I really think an article is a, is a great investment opportunity, right? We are, we are helping to redefine the software industry, and in a very real sense, software is technology, right? The average person's experience of technology increasingly is driven by software. Your, your iPhone is a software experience. The hardware is you know, increasingly minimalist, and and uh, so to me, it's a phenomenal opportunity, both from a commercial perspective, but also from a social perspective. I, I personally know the the enormously empowering impact of of developing skills base around free software, and so for me to be able to participate in bringing that to a wider audience is feels like the right thing to be doing. And it takes a weird kind of crackpot to to want to devote um, energy to something that is is so specific, mm. but. It's the best thing that I think I could be doing in the world. It's, I, a, it's I, a unique I, position to be in a, in yeah, a position yeah. where you can choose exactly what you want to do and also beyond that, choose how you want to make other things happen on, in the world in an entirely spontaneous kind of way. Like if you want to invest in telecommunications in Asia or if you want to give money to you know anti-abortion causes, which I think would be a travesty, but... Um, if you wanted to, you know, you, could, you really can choose how you want to influence, you know, exert influence in the world. And um, it, it's a great privilege. There are not that many people who have that sort of flexibility. And I think it, it says a lot about someone when you see how they do that. So a th couple of things. First, make no mistake, I, I really enjoy my life. You know, I don't do things that I, that I sort of really hate doing. And, uh, and I have a lot of fun. I, you know, I have some nice toys and I get some great holidays and I have great friends that I get to see that I wouldn't otherwise get to see. So you know, I'm not exactly an ash and sackcloth type. I don't... I don't um, <laughs> You're not another Paul Slade. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. And I know if Paul was a billionaire, he, would, he, would, he wouldn't change a bit. No. So, no. so that's, the, that's the cool thing about him. So, but I do enjoy um, what, I, what I have. Um, but then I also think very carefully about the investments that I make because I think those are not charity but they have a big influence in the world um, if I look at my investments in Africa for example I see how they are changing society they, they are rewarding economically financially but they also create they create jobs they create skills they create a social cohesion and alignment so I feel really good about those as well and then Ubuntu is special to me it's this unique combination of 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 empowering people all over the world you know there's no single charity that I could give money to that could have the same l impact in terms of giving smart people the tools to do amazing things um, and it's also a really interesting commercial opportunity right you mainly, mainly live in, in the UK as I understand London, it yeah, yeah. yeah do, is there anything you miss from South Africa is there anything you'd yeah, you'd like to bring back over here or something or that would take no, you back I will, there I think I will go back to South Africa in due course you know it really spiritually it is my home Africa is and, and, and I've never had any illusions about leaving so much as spending time elsewhere and um, the UK has been very good to me I, I have great respect for many of its um, values right and uh, and so hopefully those will stick with me wherever I go next. I mean, how about uh, three more years from now? I mean, what, what do you expect to see? I mean, are we still going to be pushing out a release every six months? And uh, I mean, what, what else can we expect to see? Well, the, the, I, I certainly expect us to be put, pushing out a release every six months. And I also expect us to have done another LTS in that time. You know, these are commitments that we can make to our users and to future users. So it's very important that we, we stick to them. And it's a very effective way for us to work. So on the release, release cycle basis, I think things are very predictable. Um, the, most, the, the thing I most want to see is, um, is people using Linux on a train, on a plane, or at home, you know, or at school, um, even if many of those people aren't aware that you know, it's Linux. You know, and the amazing thing about Linus Torvalds is I think he, 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 he doesn't need those people to know that he wrote some critical code in this whole enterprise. And I think you know, that's what we're really setting out to do. We're setting out to build software for human beings. We're set, setting out to, to help define the way the average person will interact with technology, which means interacting with software. Um, so that's kind of my, my dream for the next 
three years is to see the percentage of people who who actively chose Linux, whether it's Fedora or Ubuntu or or Gentoo or whatever, um, as a total proportion of all the users of Linux diminish greatly. Now their contribution will never diminish, right? But in in effect, the value of their contribution will increase. And so that's 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 what I really hope to see. That you know Debian developers will be able to take pride in the fact that there are you know literally tens of millions of machines that that ultimately t- tens of millions of people who benefit every day from from the, the contribution they make to society, both professional and volunteer. So uh, so that's what I'd like to see, and I hope Ubuntu plays you know plays a, a reasonable role in in making that happen. Um, now I'll be interested to see uh, what your current opinion is of the community and where you think the next few years, what would you really like to see the community progress to? Mm. Well, I mean, we have an amazing, amazingly broad community. We have guys who, we have guys who love the forums. You know, they, they, they contribute a huge amount um, uh, to shaping the thinking in the forums, shaping the discussion, um, maintaining, you know, the, the standard of excellence, the code of conduct, um, uh, making that a productive place for people to spend time. That's an enormous contribution to to the project. Uh, we have guys who, who spend a lot of time translating um, and, and focused on a particular particular audience. Um, documentation, advocacy, the loco teams. To me, it's very important to think of the community in those broadest, broadest possible senses. Um, I would also extend, you know, our community out, out into other projects, maybe in particular, and and upstreams. You know, we you know we need to be less c- conscious of the divides and more conscious of the shared goals that we have. If you look at a, a developer perspective, I think we we have built a unique community that cares about the system as a whole. If you look at Motu, for example, these are guys who are passionate about the whole experience. Um, some of them will be more focused on one set of packages or another set of packages, but fundamentally, the, the Motu and the core dev care about the whole experience. And that's quite unique. That's unusual in the free software world. Most people in the free software world are particularly interested in one or other tool. You know, they hack on Ganache or on GCC or on OpenOffice or on Firefox or on you know, any one of a number of things, and that's, that's, that's why they do it. You, um, you seem to be able to pull these people together, though. I mean, at a place like this, we're at UDS, where I've seen Ganache developers, Firefox developers, you know, all these people from upstream that you've you've pulled in together, and there's a kind of meeting of minds. We have guys here from Fedora, from SUSE, from Debian, from from other distros, and as you point out, from upstreams. Yeah, we, we're really trying to live that collaborative, open meme, and I think it works. The guys who are here are typically the guys who who feel the same way. So the guys from Firefox who care about how their bits actually land on the desktops of of somebody. It frustrates me sometimes when, you, when I see upstream communities do some amazing work, and then the distros don't highlight that work. You know, I saw, saw an example. Someone was talking about some scaling work that had been done in Apache, but in order to take advantage of it, the packages needed to be restructured in a particular way. The distros just don't know that, right? Unless we can collaborate effectively with with the upstreams, their work won't necessarily reach, reach its full potential in the hands of anybody other than a super specialist. What's, what's the real killer thing you'd like to see in Intrepid? Um, I would like to see it work really well on a small screen. I would like to see it work really well on a screen that you can, if not stick in your pocket, but, you know, lug around without feeling like you're lugging around a laptop, you know. And, um, and, and there's a ton of other stuff going on and huge stuff going on, but I want to see, I want to see us shifting the dial in, in, in favor of that kind of use case. Now, one of the things which has also been coming out is the Ubuntu Mobile. When can we actually expect to see this available to a consumer? There is a company right now that 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 has a version of it that they're shop, shopping around to retail channels and so on. And if that goes to market, then it could it could go very quickly. Uh, it's going to depend on on which companies decide to run with it. Linux is exploding in the mobile space, right? And Motorola talks about sixty percent of their phones moving to Linux. Nokia has just started talking about you know Linux playing an increasingly important role there. I don't think we fully yet understand exactly what the role of the distributions are there, but but the vision I think that the team have is this idea of being able to develop using a consistent set of tools and a consistent pa- approach to packaging something which could run on a server or something which could run on a little a little net top or a little handheld device um, and that's an awesome vision right um, it's all about innovation and specialist skills 
are an obstacle to innovation. If you know, I have this little treadmill and it's got a screen on it, a touch screen, and uh, you know, it's very clear that there are very few people who have the ability to influence how that touch screen works because there's just so many little things that are wrong with it. Now, if that thing was running, something like Ubuntu Mobile, where you know, it had open archives and you could get you know, thousands of different people to participate and collaborate on how it worked, that would be the best damn treadmill touchscreen experience. I mean, certainly, right. because you could SSH whilst you're running. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right? So, so, well, I mean, you know what I really want to do is, is, is read the news. I want to, I want to, you know, so I want to have like a, I want to have like a, a blog reader and Firefox and so on and touch gesture oriented thing and I want, to, I want to read the news while I'm on the treadmill. But phone. also, be great. I mean, I think one of the other great things is it could be customizable and it'll run custom applications on crazy devices I think I think that, that that's, right. it's, that's the thing is uh, we, we perceive it as crazy devices now but in right. a few years time it's like people thinking having Linux in your pocket or Linux on a machine that's got a 7 inch display and no hard drive you th- you know, a few years ago you might have thought that was crazy but now it's yeah, it's the norm. So just think, think of this. Think of all the places where you have something that will become a touch screen. If every photo frame in your house could become a touch screen. You know, the, you'd have one at the, entry, at the entry point of your house. You'd have one, you know, for your, to control sound and lighting and video. All these things that we currently interact with that are separate devices. Just make them all touch screens. And then articulate the vision. You could have any piece of functionality on any screen at any time. And figure out how we make that work. Right? So I want Firefox on my treadmill. Why can't I? Or I want, I want um, um, my, my, my music control system on, on the treadmill because I want to hop on the treadmill and turn the music volume up. And you know, Why can't I do that? Streaming video to that, to that same device. Then when I get off and I'm walking out the door, I want to be able to you know, turn off the, the air con and the lighting. And, you know. so, so imagine a world where literally everything, every... every Surface can become a, a place where you can drop, you know, any Ubuntu package. Mm-hmm. To me, that's what the mobile effort is all about. I love the idea of a treadmill that, that runs Linux or Ubuntu because I think of all the, the fat geeks who would uh, <laughs> <laughs> buy it who because it's got Linux on it, and, <laughs> <laughs> and then they would become right. thin geeks <laughs> and therefore increase the longevity of the open source community. Absolutely, Mark. Thank you very much for talking to us today. It's great, great, great to hang out with you guys. That about wraps up episode six. We hope you enjoyed the interview. We're going to have more interviews for you in the next show from UDS. We talked to lots of interesting people, and uh, we're going to get them out to you. Yeah, we've got a right diverse range of topics. Uh, We've uh, spoken to a few people from the Ubuntu project and outside the Ubuntu project as well. So send in your competition entries. And if you have any comments or questions for us, you can contact us in a number of ways. You can get us uh, via email. If you send an email to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can join hash ubuntu-uk on the free node network or twitter.com slash UUPC is our Twitter account. You can also leave up to 30 seconds of voicemail. The phone number is on our website. And all that's left for us to do is thank the people who mirror our podcast. And that includes Bitfolk and Show Me Do. And thanks to Mark for being interviewed by us and giving us so much of his time. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.